All right, look, the fairy type is cracked. These little cuties, your worst nightmare. And I mean it this time. I started off my last video with a joke about how the grass type was one of the best types in the game. And then I hit you with the old switcheroo because as we all know, the grass type sucks, but the fairy type, it's actually busted. Offensively, it's one of the best types in the game. And defensively, it's only weak to poison and steel, which are not great offensive types to begin with. So it's solid there too. How can I balance this monster of a type and make it so that a hardcore Nuzlocke with only fairies isn't wildly easy? Well, by playing in the Alola region. Let's do it. For the uninitiated, hi. My name is Vivid, and this will be my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke in Pokemon Ultra Sun using only fairy types. But I wanted to add even more time to a game that's notorious for all of its cutscenes, so I decided I will only be using shiny fairy types. That's right, I will be shiny hunting for every single encounter in this run. You should know that I raised the shiny odds to roughly match those of the Legends Arceus Outbreak method because I want to finish this game before my seven month old daughter graduates from high school. And those odds still seem reasonable to me. While the fairy type might be absolutely disgusting, do not expect this to be a flawless run because the ultra games are insane and the rules make it so much harder. If a Pokemon faints, it's gone forever. I'm not allowed to use any items in battle other than held items. I always play on set mode. I can't level up past the next totem Pokemon or grand trial. And finally, I'll only be able to catch the first shiny fairy type I encounter on any route. If this wasn't enough, let's just say I made some questionable plays and ended up on the wrong side of RNG a few times. You'll see later. Before we jump in, let me know your favorite fairy type in the comments down below. Mine has to be Shenotic, which thankfully we can catch and use in this game. I just think mushrooms are neat and he looks like a super fun guy. <laughs> All right, here we go. We start off our run by saving right before we select our starter and soft resetting over and over again until we finally get a shiny Poplio. This water puppy isn't a fairy type yet, but she will be later, so the rules I play with let me use her. This singular encounter took me something like two hours, so while I may have raised the odds, encounters can still take a ton of time. So if you appreciate the dedication, please follow me on Twitter. I make bad jokes like the fun guy bit all the time. I name her Caroline, and as always, I have a secret naming theme that it's up to you to guess. This show is one of my guilty pleasures. That's the only hint you're getting. Don't judge me. Okay, good luck. We charge through the early game, beating Howe a handful of times. We get a Pokedex from the Jack Professor that is possessed by a Rotom that has to have ADHD. And then we end up at our first real challenge, the Trainer School. This part of the game is required to move on, and there isn't a singular other fairy type we can encounter before we have to face Principal Emily, who has a level 10 Rowlet. So we have to challenge her. I send out Caroline into her Alolan Hoot Hoot and go for a pound. It does basically nothing and leafage does close to half my HP bar, so we're off to a great start. I go for baby doll eyes to lower its attack on the next turn, but it doesn't matter. Two more leafages knock out Caroline and we wide out. This means the run is a wipe and I have to reset, which is... <sighs> Not great. So I start the soft resetting process all over again, and after about one and a half Game Nights episodes, we have our shiny mermaid seal thing again. So I grind out the early game again, get back to the trainer school, and it's here that I realize my first failure was due to a lack of planning, a lack of learning, a lack of skills, if you will. So learn from my mistake and use Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video to level up your own skill sets. Let me thank them real quick. While there might not be a course exclusively on how to get better at Nuzlocking, there are thousands of high quality courses on Skillshare covering a wide variety of topics. Whatever you're interested in from video editing or animation to even gardening, Skillshare has a class for you. As someone who was a high school teacher for five years, I fully believe in everything Skillshare has to offer. The classes are efficient at delivering their lessons in a reasonable amount of time while still being structured, they surround you with an entire community of people that are interested in exactly what you are interested in, and there are new classes that are uploaded every week so there's always something new to discover. I myself am currently watching YouTube Success Script Shoot and Edit by MKBHD and The Ultimate Self Care Playbook by Jonathan Van Ness because I not only want to get better at content creation but I want to be better at taking care of myself. You can also watch classes on all of your devices making learning on the go super convenient. So, if you want to invest in your personal growth or maybe just pick up a new hobby, the first 1,000 people that use my custom link in the description or my code in vivid color at checkout will get one month of Skillshare completely free. And after that, it's incredibly affordable. 
No, seriously, what are you waiting for? Click my link in the description down below, go on over to Skillshare and learn an entirely new skill today for free. Once again, thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this content and helping me continue to make videos. Now, back to Principal Emily. I've given Caroline an Oran Berry, which I just completely blanked on doing the first time, and taught her work up. I start the battle by using Baby Doll Eyes twice to lower the Demon Owl's attack while taking two leafages to just above half health. On the next turn, I use Work Up while getting dropped to just below half, which causes me to eat my berry and restore 10 HP. Then, it's just a damage race from here. I go for Disarming Voice, which does what looks like a little bit less than 25%, while Rowlet's Leafage does around 25% of the HP I have left. Great. Over the next two turns, we trade attacks, and the Rowlet looks like it's only in range of a high roll, while Caroline is at 4 HP and will die to being spit on. I lock into Disarming Voice and we get the high roll, which is absolutely massive. Even with better prep, this was still super close, which is honestly indicative of how this run will go. Now, we can finally make our way to Hallowly City where we can find our next encounter, a Mime Junior. After another unreasonably long shiny hunting session, we find and catch the baby clown. I name her Elena. With our newest member, it's time for the Illima fight, which can also be incredibly hard because even though Smeargle is a trash Pokemon, it has okay-ish stats for this part of the game, and Technician boosting the power of its attack Attacks makes it hit super hard. I lead off with Caroline into Young Goose, and after two workups, I'm able to two shot the long rat with relatively high HP left. Smeargle comes out next, and since I've been leered a couple of times, I start spamming Baby Doll Eyes to lower the Smeargle's attack. Smeargle's first leafage takes me down to low yellow, but activates my Oran Berry. Another leafage drops me to 9 HP, but my calcs are saying it's super likely for me to live another, so I stay in and Baby Doll Eyes one last time, and I get dropped to just 1 HP. Big yeah. Yikes. A slightly higher roll, and I was toast here, and probably had to reset. I switch into Elena and just start spamming Confusion. Since the Painter Puppy is at minus 3 attack, its tackles aren't doing a ton of damage, and I'm able to out damage it over the next few turns, thankfully dodging any crits. Okay, the early game of Ultra Sun and Moon are absolutely brutal for monotype locks. Confirmed. Now that I can leave the city, I make my way to Route 2 where I can shiny hunt for my next encounter before taking on my first totem battle. This one again takes forever, but I eventually find a pretty pink bee, catch her, and name her Bonnie. Her ability is Honey Gatherer, which does absolutely nothing, but I still love her. These are the only Pokemon I'll be able to take into the first totem battle, so after a little bit of training, we just head into Verdant Caverns. If you're paying attention, you'll notice that Caroline is level 13 and already over the level cap, but I always let a single level slide for the first island trial because when you only have one or two Pokemon, there is too much forced experience in the beginning of these games to reliably stay under the limit, and I always stop enforcing the cap as soon as I enter a trial because I can't control how much experience I get during it. I hope you understand. After chasing a few long rats around, I make my way to the back of the cavern where I am ambushed by an extremely long rat who is yelling some nonsense about a wall. Unclear. I lead off with Bonnie and on turn 1 paralyze the Gumchoos with a Stun Spore while it just goes for Scary Face. On the next turn I switch into Caroline and from here I just keep clicking Baby Doll Eyes lowering the attack of the Grumpy Dictator and the Lackey he summons for the next 6 or 7 turns. My Oran Berry gets eaten at some point and keeps me healthy enough that I can get multiple attack drops off on both Pokemon. Once Caroline is dangerously low I switch back into Bonnie and just start using Silver Wind. 3 is enough to vote out the Sitting Totem and get him banned on Twitter. And on the next turn the Younger Patriot goes down to a single gust of wind from a tiny little pink fairy, which I feel is very metaphorical somehow, I just can't put my finger on it right now. The old grump runs off into the cave screaming about unfinished walls, voter fraud, something about a swamp. I'm not sure, this is a Pokemon game and none of these make sense, so I'll just grab the normal Z crystal and move on. With the first island trial down, I make my way to Mele Mele Meadows and run around until I find this shiny cotton ball. I catch him and name him Alaric. He has the prankster ability which will let him use status moves at priority speed, which is actually an incredibly powerful thing to do when combined with moves like Toxic or Leech Seed. Now the only challenge left on Melee Melee is Kahuna Hala, and he uses fighting types. Bonnie quad resists fighting types and has Draining Kiss, a super effective stab move that will heal me for three fourths of the damage dealt. If you can't solve the equation, let me do it for you. We beat the shit out of Hala. Poor old guy. After beating him down, he lets me ride his bull so I can go pick up some items that were inaccessible earlier, but mostly this means that I can get Thief and steal some leftovers from 
from these Munchlax. I've said this in every run, I absolutely love leftovers and I will use them whenever possible. I can now access 10 Carat Hill, so I head to the furthest hollow and encounter a shiny carbink through the SOS method that I named Klaus, and inside the cave I find a Mawile that I catch and named Catherine. Both of these Pokemon will be absolutely huge for my team, since Carbink is close to Immortal, and I have a really dope set in mind for him, and Mawile is a part Steel type with Intimidate, which gives me super good defensive synergy with the rest of my team and will help me deal with strong physical attackers better. Also, both of these hunts went by pretty quickly, which is a refreshing change of pace. After my latest two additions, Caroline evolves into Brion, and with that, we are completely done with Melee Melee. So it's time to head to Akala Island. To get there, I have to Mantine Surf, and let's just say I went nuts with this mini game during this run. Mantine Surfing gets you BP, which you can use for move tutor moves on the beaches, but you can also spend the points in a different location on super useful items. We'll talk about it later, but just know I earned something like 600 BP Mantine Surfing in this run. On Akala Island, we run into the thickest, and that's with three Cs, Kahuna in the entire game in Olivia. I don't really have a point here, I just wanted you to know. Now on Route 4, I get that itch to shiny hunt again, so I run in circles like the epic gamer I am until this pink puffball shows up. In case you can't tell either, this thing is definitely shiny. I almost ran away from it, but thankfully I decided to look up both of Iggly Buff's sprites before doing so. I catch him and name him Tyler, and unfortunately, I do not foresee him being very useful. In Pinolia Ranch, we run into Hal for the first real rival battle where he has somewhat of a decent team, but Klaus, who is pretty underleveled at this point, manages to solo almost his entire team by setting up Sharpens, because nothing hurts him. I'm telling you right now, Carvink is an immortal. Before we head into our next island challenge, we run into a 2008 scene kid, and he's mad that his local Hot Topic is going out of business or something, so he challenges us to a battle. The scene kid leads with the Zubat, but secretly it's a Zora disguised as a Zubat. So I lead with Bonnie, who just decimates his little Shadow Fox, and after that, I switch to Klaus, get to plus six attack, and then sweep the rest of his team. As his last Pokemon goes down, I let him know that Rar XD doesn't really mean I love you in Dinosaur, and he runs off sad and defeated. Carbink has got to be one of the best setup sweepers for a run like this, and I absolutely mean that. With that out of the way, we head straight for our next totem battle, and this one is a nightmare. I don't care how many runs you've watched where people breeze past this battle, it's super tough. The Araquanid fight takes place in permanent rain, boosting the power of its bubble, which is already boosted from its ability. You're probably thinking, but bubble is only a 40 base power move, you're just bad. And while you're kind of right, you also play this game like a little baby. So let's do some math real quick. 40 times 1.5 times 1.5 times 2, which is the calculation bubble goes through through after stab, rain, and water bubble. What you end up with is a bubble that hits with a final calculated damage of 180, or to put it in baby terms for you, stronger than hyper beam. So sit down and shut up. <clears throat> Sorry, I brought up my teacher voice there for a moment. I will try not to do that again. I lead off with a Laric and just set up Leech Seed on turn one, while the Water Spooter hits me with a Leech Life for over half of my HP. Leftovers and Leech Seed Drain bring me back over half, and the Spider calls in its little buddy at the end of the turn. On the next turn, I switch into Catherine for the Intimidate drop, and both Spiders go for Bug-type moves, which is great because those do negative damage against her. I switch into Caroline on the next turn, predicting Water-type attacks, and I call it right, as she takes about 25% from both bubbles combined. I stay in an on Encore the Araquanid, forcing it to use Leech Life over and over again for the next few turns. In the end, it didn't really matter what I encored this demon into, I just need to know for sure what it's going to go for to manage my switches a little better. I switch back into Catherine, who takes nothing from a Leech Life, but something like 35% from the little spider's bubble, which is a lot of damage. I decide to stay in and get some chip off by using Breakneck Blitz, but it does like 5% or something, which is super embarrassing. Catherine is in range of crits now, so I switch back out into Caroline and Encore the Araquanid into a bubble, which lets me switch back into a Laric, who almost dies to two bubbles, even though they are resisted. But we hang on, and the big spider drops to what has to be one HP from Leech Seed. A protect on the next turn secures the KO on Araquanid, and three Giga Drains is enough to take out the small spider over the next few turns while I stay healthy. Wowie, if I did not have Leech Seed chip chugging away for this battle, I'm almost 100% positive I lose multiple Pokemon in this fight. A Laric is the MVP for sure of this battle for being being able to set up seeds alone. After the totem Pokemon falls, we can officially catch Pokemon in Brooklet Hill, and I shiny hunt for a while before finding her. But eventually, my single favorite fairy Pokemon, More Lulz, shines for us. I love this little shroom, and now that there's a fungus among us, I'm feeling super good about the late game because Shinodic is such a solid Pokemon for runs like this. I name her Liv, and I let her go to the PC for now. 
Our next island trial is right around the corner, and if you watched me play through this game with only electric types, you should understand that I have a bit of PTSD about this battle. It cost me some double digit number of resets in my first run of the Ultra games, so I do not take it lightly. Before we get to that though, we have to go play this battle royale minigame, and it's ultra important to our run. Not the minigame, the minigame is terrible, but the reward shop inside here is cracked. It is in fact the location I hinted at earlier that sells so many valuable items for BP, so I grind out man surfing for a while then head back to the shops and stock up on goods. The highlights of my haul include ability capsules which will let me change between any two normal abilities a Pokemon can have, power items to make EV training super fast, and a really sick assortment of held items. I stock up on what I need for now and then I head to Kiawe's trial, but I'll 100% be coming back here later. So about Kiawe's trial, it forces you to knock out an Alolan Marowak and a Magmar before you ever get to the totem fight, and you don't get to heal your Pokemon or reposition in between battles. So. I just lead with Caroline and blow back both Pokemon with my briny blitz beam Z move, and then we face off with the demon itself. Totem Marowak. I click Icy Wind on turn 1 since the ghost gets a speed boost and lowering its speed could be really helpful, but mostly I do this because this thing is notorious for using Detect on turn 1, which it does. At the end of the turn it calls in its spicy lizard friend, and on the next turn I just lock into my wild wet water Z move. Caroline takes a Venoshock and a Brick Break to low red, but she survives and lands the attack on Marowak, and it goes down in one hit. After that, I switch directly into Klaus to preserve care, and Klaus takes nothing from the spicy lizard's attacks, and gets the KO with a couple of rock tombs. What a difference having access to a water type makes for runs like this in this battle. It's actually incredible. For what it's worth, if you paid attention to Klaus's moveset, I think he could have soloed the entire battle as well. I'm running him with a rest, sleep talk, sharpen, and rock tomb set, which would be able to consistently heal off damage, and hit both Pokemon for super effective rock type attacks. So, I had an a plus backup plan in case Caroline couldn't do it on her own. With the tiny level cap increase, I'm able to EV train my entire team, which I explained in my electric only run, but a quick summary is the SOS mechanic doubles what EV you get from knocking out a Pokemon, and the power items add a flat 8 EVs to every KO, meaning once you have a chain going, each KO is worth 18 EVs if the Pokemon is normally only giving you one, and the experience you get is so trivial from Melee Melee Island that it's a super fast way to max out the EVs on every Pokemon without ever pushing over a level cap. So I EV train my entire team in under an hour. And just to save time, for future reference, every new Pokemon that I capture, I EV train in the same manner. I also SOS hunt and catch a shiny Eevee before continuing on and name him Damon because Eevee has main character energy. But I don't super plan on using him for now. This might offend people, but Sylveon isn't super versatile, and I think I'll get better mileage out of having Pokemon that have more versatile sets available to them, or Pokemon that just have a stronger niche. If I ever need a fairy type to just hit like a truck, I can come back to Damon. I just wanted to mention him before moving on. We have the final island trial on Akala next, and this one always seems to be a little inconsequential. Unfortunately, so many Pokemon resist grass, so Lorantis's gimmick of using Solar Blade in the sun just isn't as impactful as it should be. Starting off, I lead with Catherine to get an Intimidate drop, and then I immediately switch into Alaric to leech seed the Kecleon that the Bacon Plant calls in. I do some pivoting around for a while in between Catherine and Pokemon that will bait out Solar Blade like Caroline or Klaus, until the plant just doesn't doesn't have an attack stat left. I pick off the Kecleon with a Brick Break from Catherine, and the only scary moment of the fight comes from a crit solar blade that does less than half to Catherine. Once the Kecleon is down, I switch to Bonnie who is able to chew on solar blades and eventually KO the Lorantis with Silver Winds. After that, I just pick off the Comfey that was called in and the totem battle is over. Like I said, this battle is just never as hard as it appears to be. After the battle, Bonnie is level 25 so she evolves into Rabombi and learns Pollen Puff. B is one of my favorite Pokemon from this generation and if she can stick around and learn Quiver Dance later, I think she's going to be an absolute nightmare for our opponents. Now that we can hunt in the lush forest, I buckle up for what ends up being the longest hunt of the run and start looking for shiny Comfey. After hours of grinding over a couple of different hunting sessions, I finally find her. I catch her, breathe the sigh of relief, and name her Jenna. Comfey has the really cool triage ability which will let her use healing moves at plus 3 priority, but without access to the move reminder yet, she's a little meh. She really needs Leech Seed and Drain 
Wing Kiss to pop off properly, but with those moves, I think she could be an actual threat. I head towards my grand trial for Akala Island, the battle against Olivia, and while training up a little, Liv evolves into Shenotic, and I just know she is going to be such a massive help against Olivia's rock types. We make our way into Kony Kony City to meet Olivia at her house, but she ghosts me, and her Probo Pass tells me where to go instead. It's a really strange interaction that I just wanted to share. Via the instructions given to us by a big rock with an even bigger mustache, we make our way to Olivia on the Akala outskirts and challenge her. I lead off with Catherine into her Anorith for the Intimidate drop, and on turn 1, I take a Metal Claw for close to nothing, and then squash the bug for around 75% of its health with a Rock Tomb. Another Rock Tomb drops the bug on the next turn, and she sends in Laleep. So, I scale damage with a Brick Break, and it's just not a ton, so I decide to show off Jenna a bit. I switch her in, and just start setting up Growths, and clicking Synthesis to stay healthy until I'm at plus 6 Special Attack. From here, Giga Drain is a clean 2 hit KO on the leap, and Olivia sends out her ace, Lycanroc. But, I have a plus 6 priority Giga Drain, and I just erase it. I might have even deleted its data from the game. I'm not sure, but I know that that specific Lycanroc is Mondo dead. We're halfway done with our Grand Trials, and we have to make a quick stop at the Aether Paradise, which doesn't look menacing or somehow evil at all. We talk to Lusamine here, who also seems very nice and not like someone who is secretly a villain, and then encounter the Ultra Beast Nihiligo. And this is essentially a legendary poison type, which could probably wipe my entire team. But here's something I didn't know about this fight. You can just run from it. So I do that, and we're back onto our island challenge. On Ula Ula Island, we can't actually do anything until we battle Hao, and this is the first fight where his team is actually threatening. He has evolved his Pikachu, his Tauros hits hard, and his Eevee is evolved to counter whatever starter you picked. So it's just a really well-rounded team. Thankfully, Klaus easily takes on his Tauracat, Bonnie one-shots his Leafeon, Raichu, and Noibat, and Tauros is easily dealt with by Catherine. So it's a rough fight, but we have the right pieces for it. I go ahead and do a little bit of exploring on the new island to collect items, and while I'm attempting to fight a father and son duo to get a twisted spoon for Elena, tragedy strikes. I grossly underestimate how much damage a knockoff from a Grimer will do to Elena, and she just drops, marking our first death in the run. This was just poor play. My entire team resists knockoff except Elena, who was neutral to it, so I have no clue what I was thinking here. Rest in peace, Elena, while you can. Also, in case you're wondering, I did get the twisted spoon, I just no longer have any use for it. Ironic. Our next totem battle will certainly be one of the hardest in the run, because even though it is the electric trial, it's also secretly the steel trial. While planning, it looked like I had no real way to substantially damage Totem Togunamaru, but secretly, Liv was the answer. You're given the hidden power TM pretty early in the game, and after checking every Pokemon's hidden power type, it turns out that Liv actually has HP ground, which is fantastic. So, I start the trial by hunting for some battery bugs, and I make one of the most important discoveries of the run. All of the charge bugs used in this trial are named numerically, so 1 bug to 9 bug. Okay, it's not actually very important, but it is hilarious. And after a simple puzzle, the Totem Pikachu clone challenges us. I lead off with Catherine to get the attack drop and switch into Liv on the first turn while Togedemaru goes for Spiky Shield, which fails, and then it calls in Skarmory, which is a nightmare to deal with. On the next turn, I double back into Catherine for another attack drop, and I take two Steel-type attacks for around one-fourth of my HP. Continuing the switch game, I switch back into Liv, taking some soft hits, and then back into Catherine once more to put Togedemaru at minus 3 and Skarm at minus 2 attack. But, this time Togedemaru gets a critical hit Iron Head, dropping Catherine to just 12 HP, letting Skarm pick her off with a Steel Wing. Devastating. That's what this is. Catherine gave me such good defensive synergy, and Intimidate has been so valuable, this is just terrible. I switch into Alaric, knowing that I need to drop its attack stats some more and put these two on a clock, both of which are things Alaric can accomplish. Accomplish. On his first turn out, I charm the Metal Rat, dropping its attack even further, and I take a super light Iron Head and get tormented. On the next turn, I Leech Seed the Skarmory as the Togedemaru uses Spiky Shield, and the bird just sets up a Tailwind. Since I'm tormented, I can't use the same attack twice in a row, so I can't actually Leech Seed Togedemaru, so instead I charm Skarmory and take a super soft tap from Togedemaru, but then RNG strikes again, and Skarmory, who is now at minus 4 attack by the way, gets a critical hit Steel Wing and KOs Alar. Both of the Pokemon I just lost were massive players, and both to crits. Absolutely disgusting. I bring out Liv and attempt to sleep powder the Togedemaru, but it misses and I take an Iron Head and Steel Wing to under half. So on the next turn, I click Moonlight while the
all the rat spiky shields, and the Skarm just sets up rocks. The health from Moonlight plus Leech Seed is enough to get me back to full health, and on the next turn, I click Hidden Power Ground, and it absolutely chunks the Armor Rodent. But when I go for the KO on the next turn, it uses Spiky Shield and then Skarm torments me, meaning I once again cannot use the same attack twice in a row, which makes playing around the AI protecting a nightmare. Skarmory eventually gets paralyzed from Liv's Effect Spore, and then goes down shortly after to Leech Seeds, prompting Togedemaru to call out Dedenne. Then it happens. I get tired of playing around Torment because the AI always seems to predict right, so I switch into Bonnie who takes rock damage, and Iron Head, and Super Fang but manages to live. I have no clue what I was thinking by making this next play, but instead of just hard switching out, I assume I outspeed both of these Pokemon because I've maxed out my speed EVs, so I U-turn on the Dedenne, and I do not outspeed, and Bonnie just goes down. This was just unnecessary. U-turning did nothing for me. It wasn't going to do any meaningful damage, and it was, in my mind, going to be a fast U-turn, so I have no clue why I ever made this play. Feeling utterly defeated, I switch in Liv, and Hidden Power Ground is able to finally take out the Togedemaru, and Giga Drain deals with Dedenne while I stay relatively healthy. As a very small silver lining for my team, Caroline evolves immediately after the battle, giving me an incredibly strong Pokemon in Primarina, but wow, my team just took a beating. Three Pokemon. Three really solid, good Pokemon. That's what this one trial cost me. Before Ula Ula Island, I had zero deaths this run, and now I have four. I contemplate resetting right here, but I've put so much time into this run already that I felt like that wasn't an option. So I went to the PC, boxed all of my dead Pokemon, grabbed Comfey and Igglybuff, and moved on. Rest in peace, friends. Your sacrifices won't be forgotten. Still needing another team member to fill out my team, I run around in the grass on Mount Hokulani until I find a Cleffa. Then I SOS chain it until one shines. I catch him and name him Stefan. While it might seem odd to pick Cleffa and Igglybuff over a potential Sylveon, the truth is I don't super need any of them right away, but I think that Wigglytuff will be more diverse and Clefable just flat out a better Pokemon than Sylveon in the long run, so I decide to run with them. Since both Tyler and Stefan have friendship evolutions, I run around like crazy to max out their values, then level them up so they both evolve. Moonstones will come later, but for now, they're mostly just soaking up experience to get the level what moves they need before I evolve them. I now have to fight Guzma in the park before moving on, but Liv has learned Strength Zap, which can make battles against physical Pokemon without super effective moves trivial. If you don't know what Strength Zap does, it lowers your opponent's attack stat by one, then heals you for whatever number their stat equals after that drop. So if used on a Pokemon with an attack stat of 100, you would lower their attack, then heal for 66 HP. It's an insanely strong move, and Liv easily walls Guzma's Galissapod, and then Klaus hard walls his Masquerade for a super easy win. With most of Ula Ula unlocked, I now have two shiny hunts I can do back to back. The first is for Dedenne, otherwise known as the worst Pikachu clone. For how garbage this Pokemon is, it takes entirely too long to find. And when I do finally find and catch the shiny, it has its pickup ability and not cheek pouch. At first, I thought this was a massive negative, but it turned out to be super important, and you'll see why later. Regardless, I name her Lexi, and I actually add her to the team for now, because I do not care at all if she dies. The second fairy I can hunt for is Alolan Vulpix, which when evolved has one of the best offensive types in the game in Ice and Fairy, making it a great asset to my future team even if it's pretty weak defensively. This hunt was my fastest and only took like 30 minutes, which is what I expected most of my hunts to take when I boosted the odds, but wow has that not been the case. I catch the shiny Ice Fox and name her Elena V. If you've correctly guessed the reference for my names, you should get this. Basically a main character dies and and then undies. You should definitely be able to guess the theme after this hint. With those two encounters down, it's time for the Mimikyu trial, and this is the first trial where the totem Pokemon gets an Omni boost, meaning it gets a boost to every single one of its stats, which is terrifying. But I've got a pretty strong team, so I'm feeling good about it. I lead Lexi into Mimikyu and just click Volt Switch on turn one with the plan of breaking its disguise. The Pikachu wannabe misses a play rough, which is phenomenal, and I'm able to pivot out and to live while breaking the Cloth Goblin's disguise. All in all, a perfect turn one. Mimikyu calls in Banette, which is mostly fine, and on the next turn, it connects a play rough into Liv, which chunks for about half my health, and the Banette curses me. I land a Strength Sap going back up to full, but the curse starts chipping away, meaning I'll have to switch out because I can't out-heal both Pokemon attacking me and the curse. I bring in Klaus, who swallows a play rough whole, and cancels Banette's Screech with Clear Body. On the next turn, I take another soft hit, and the Banette 
burns me with Will-O-Wisp while I set up Sharpens. This isn't terrible since I can rest, but on the next turn, Banette takes itself out to Curse, which is less than ideal since I end the turn burned in at 28 health. I stay in and click rest, thankfully dodging a critical hit, and survive on just 4 HP. Then I go to sleep completely healing myself to full and getting rid of the burn. I switch back into Live since once again I can't really outheal the damage from the curse and the attacks from Mimikyu, and she takes a reasonable chunk from a play rough, but I'm in a good range to survive another. So I stay in and eat another hit, which actually activates my effect spore, but I forgot this Fakachu is holding a Lumberry, so it doesn't even matter. I get off a Strength Sap and go almost all the way back up to full, and next turn I Giga Drain for over half the ghost's health while taking another soft hit, and at the end of the turn, Mimikyu calls in Jellicent. I change targets and drain the Jelly next turn for almost all its health, but it goes for a Spite, slashing away four of Giga Drain's PP, meaning if it does the same thing next turn, I won't even be able to attack. I switch into Caroline on a soft Shadow Claw, and on the next turn, I sparkling Aria to take out the Jellicent, but it does almost nothing to the Mimikyu. Finally, I click Shadow Ball on the next turn, and the Nada Pikachu goes down. This fight is a nightmare, but we got through it completely unscathed, which is amazing. You might think I head back into the store to Shiny Hunt after beating the Totem Mimikyu, but you would be wrong. In order to maximize my encounters, I have to hold off on my Thrifty Mega Mart encounter until later. At this point in the game, the story starts to really pick up, so I have to go invade the Team Skull base to save a little Young Goose, but that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that the Team Skull grunts tell you that you can't get past them because of their barricade, but you manage to get past it because they left hella holes in their fences, which is just super funny to me. Also, remember how I told you just moments ago that I had to push my Thrifty Mega Mart encounter back? Well, this is the reason. I've been collecting these stupid golden stickers for my entire run, and outside of the Team Skull Lair, I find the last stickers I need to get me to a total of 80. Once I do, Alolan Oak calls me because now I have the magical number of stickers for a Totem Mimikyu. And before you tell me that Totem Pokemon are shiny locked, you should know that when I changed the shiny odds, I also removed the shiny lock on Mimikyu, so I can in fact hunt it. And I did this for two reasons. One, I wanted my Mimikyu to be big. Two, it's dumb that Totem Pokemon are shiny locked. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk, and I will not be taking any questions. With Mimikyu unlocked, I go start my second soft resetting hunt of the run, and it takes a while, but I finally get my gray cloth boy. I name him Silas, and I absolutely love how large he is. Now that I have my Mimikyu, I can go back to the Thrifty Mega Mart and hunt for Klefki. I start an SOS chain with the keys, and after losing several sets of keys, I finally find my gold key ring. But not only do I find one shiny, for the first time, I actually find two back to back, which is insane even when you take the raised odds into account. I catch the male set of keys and name him Kai. And even though Klefki looks pretty harmless, it's secretly an actual demon. With my new encounters, I head back to the Skull Lair and I absolutely crush Guzma. I'm going to spare you the turn by turn details, but very resist bug, so this was never going to be a challenge. Also, Guzma goes absolutely ballistic when he loses, and it's really funny. As soon as the Skull Lair is cleared out, I realize that I can fight this man in front of the Tapu Village Pokemon Center, and he will just give me a choice specs, which is an incredible power boost to Caroline. I then find out that Lily, who I don't believe I have mentioned at all up to this point, has been captured, so I have to go to the Aether Paradise and save her, because surprise, that place is evil. Before I do though, this old man with really dark bags under his eyes forces me to fight him, and this is our third grand trial, which came out of absolutely nowhere. Anyway, he uses dark types, and a lot of my Pokemon just learn their fairy type stab moves with the new level cap, so he gets decimated. And we move on. In Aether Paradise, there is actually a pretty tough gauntlet of trainers you have to go through, but our team is really stacked at this point, so I'm gonna skip them for time. I was able to get through unscathed pretty easily, and that's all you really need to know. We make our way to Lily, who's been kidnapped by none other than her mother. Lusamine, who also turns out to be evil. What a twist! And the 2008 scene kid from earlier is her brother? What a twist. Anyway, I have to challenge Lusamine to free Lily, and her team is pretty stacked, but so is mine at this point, so I'm not worried about it. I lead off with Liv into Hercule Fable, who hits me pretty hard with a moon blast, but Liv has recently learned Spore, so I just put the pink puff to sleep and switch into Caroline, who is able to mow down the Clefable with two specs boosted sparkling Arias. Lusamine sends out Lilligant, and I 
don't know why the AI bugs out with Lilligant so much, but she tends to just spam Teeter Dance over and over, even if your Pokemon's already confused. So after some switching, I end up in with Liv, who is able to uproot the Lilligant with a Moonblast. She sends in her Lopunny next, but like most Pokemon, it can't touch Klaus. So I do the Sharpen Rest Sleep Talk Dance until her bunny goes down, which prompts her to send in Milotic. This Pokemon can be a nuisance, but I have such a free switch into Liv, who I've kept healthy with Strength Saps, so I take it. A Hydro Pump does basically nothing, and on the next turn, I Spore the Fish, putting it to sleep. I click Giga Drain to get some health back, and it hits for over half of the Serpent's HP, but I'm starting to get worried about the level cap because I need to stay under level 49 for the Coma O trial, so instead of just taking the KO here, I switch into Lexi. Well, surprise, Milotic wakes up and hits with a Hydro Pump, dropping Lexi to just 38 HP. Not a big deal, I can just Volt Switch out, right? Well, surprise, 2.0, Lexi has a negative speed nature and a really awful speed IV, so she gets outsped and murked. I mean, Lexi was always going to be sack fodder, but I could have saved it for later. This was just negligent. I'm sorry, rat. Rest in peace. I switch into Mimikyu and take out the fish with a Hone Claw boosted Shadow Claw, and her last Pokemon is a Beware who gets obliterated by a Moonblast from Caroline. I definitely could have done this fight deathless, but I guess that's the price I pay for trying to make sure that Liv, who I was never going to use against the Coma O Totem battle anyway, stayed under the level cap. I'm really good at this game. Lusamine is so embarrassed at losing to a child that she opens up a black hole and jumps in. And Guzma follows her. There is a 0% chance you would ever catch me randomly jumping into rifts in the fabric of reality itself. Now, would I stick my head in and peek through to the other side? Maybe. But just blindly jumping in? No shot. So I guess we'll probably never see them again, and that's just fine with me. Time for the final island. And we arrive on Pony Island, and I have to do some damage control. There is a long road ahead to get to the next trial, and my team is mega close to the level cap. So right after going and grabbing this random flute that I'm told I need, I evolve a ton of Pokemon. I use two Moonstones to evolve Tyler and Stefan into Wigglytuff and Clefable, respectively. Then I evolve Elena into Ninetales with an Ice Stone. I've been holding off on these evolutions for a while so they would all have the level up moves they need, and thankfully, they're ready. With my new team, I head into the Pony Wild but once here, I realize there is an encounter I didn't even know about just lurking around on this route. Granbull is available as a wild Pokemon here, and honestly, I thought I was out of encounters, so this was a super pleasant surprise. I run around until I find a shiny bulldog, catch him, and name him Enzo. Firstly, Granbull shiny is a little off-putting because it's basically a flesh tone, which I find unsettling. Secondly, Enzo doesn't have Intimidate, but I still have an ability capsule from earlier in the game, so he actually does have Intimidate, which is great for my team. Now I have to make my way through Pony Path, which has a ton of tough trainers, but we're able to get through without any problems and we arrive at the Como O trial. You might think that this fight will be an easy clap since he's quad weak to fairy type attacks, and I think it would if I still had Catherine, but Como O gets an Omni boost at the beginning of the battle. It has Poison Jab to hit fairy types hard, and and it's also holding a Roselli Berry, meaning even Specs boosted Moonblast from Caroline will never one hit KO. To make matters worse, Como O will most likely call in Scizor because Steel is super effective against most of my team, and Scizor has Technician boosted bullet punches, which run through my team. Basically, what I'm telling you is this fight is somehow still really damn hard, and Kai, the one Pokemon who would make it easier, is at level 50, so I can't use him. Okay, let's do this. I start off the battle with Caroline, and on turn one, I take a Poison Jab for over half my health, then Specs Boosted Moonblast leaves the Como O with about 25% health. I'm hoping Caroline will coax out the Noivern as an SOS partner since she isn't weak to steal, but Como O still calls in Scizor, which is terrible. I switch into Enzo on the next turn so Care doesn't die, and he gets an Intimidate off, dropping both Pokemon's attack stat, then takes a Poison Jab for right under half that also poisons him. The Scissor just sets up Light Screen here, which is actually perfect. On the next turn, I switch into Tyler, and this is just a sack. Tyler never really got to do anything, but we needed a safe switch, and he provided that. Thanks for understanding, buddy. He drops to a bullet punch poison jab combo, which lets me safely switch in Silas. I lock into play rough as a bullet punch breaks my disguise, and a poison jab does surprisingly little. Then my ghost goes to play with a dragon demon, but he plays a little too rough and knocks it out. So now, I just have to get through the armor bug. A bullet punch will still KO Mimikyu from this range, and I 
can't do much damage anyway. So I switch into Enzo for the Intimidate drop and he actually lives the bullet punch. I then run a few calcs and Caroline can always take two non-critical hit bullet punches from her current HP. So I switch her in taking a light tap as the light screen falls. I lock into Sparkling Aria on the next turn and the scissor doesn't even bullet punch. So I outspeed and take it out in one hit. Okay, wow. These games have such carefully crafted challenges. When I started this run, I thought there was no shot this would be a hard battle, but I was really close to losing multiple Pokemon here, which is insane. Losing Tyler brings the death total up to six for this run, and I think that's the most I've ever had without wiping, which is not what I expected in a run with one of the strongest types in the game. With the Coma O trial done, I make my way to the Altar of the Sun, where Lily and I start a flute jam band that somehow causes the little derp she's been carrying around in her bag all game to evolve into a massive robot lion. It kind of looks like Liger from that old show Zoids. Anyway, another rift in the fabric of reality opens up, and evil mommy and her goon fall out of it and bring this prism demon with them. The Zoid and the demon fight, but then the demon eats the Zoid and they merge into a prism demon Zoid lion. It's all very confusing, but now I have to fight it. Listen, Duskmane Necrozma is super strong and would normally be a nightmare to fight, but this thing's AI is ridiculously dumb. So we take it out with a few sparkling arias while it just keeps trying to heal with morning sun. The prism demon Zoid lion then retreats into the Terran reality, which somehow causes all of the light in Alola to go away. And as is typical in Pokemon games, it is now up to me, a preteen, to save the world. So we jump into a wormhole, ride a ghost bat, and make our way to the Ultra Megalopolis, which sounds really dumb, but looks really cool. Now, I have a confession to make. My footage for the Ultra Necrozma fight was corrupted. I'm not sure why, because the recording is like 13 minutes long, but I can only render out 9 minutes of it, which only cut out the last two turns of battle, but still, I decided to use state-of-the-art animation techniques to show you the fight in its entirety. So sit back and enjoy. Now in the Ultra Megalopolis, I chased down the demon and once I caught up with it, it digivolved into Necrozmamon Ultra Dragon Mode, which is wild because I thought this was a Pokemon game. Also, no, it wasn't actually shiny, but I used the shiny sprite in this animation because it's dope. Let it be. I started the fight by sending out Silas and on turn one, Ultra Necrozma used Smart Strike and broke my disguise while I used Toxic to badly poison it. This is the perfect turn one and thankfully the AI goes for super effective moves here because if it just spammed Photon Geyser, I would lose since that move ignores disguise completely. On the next turn, I just use Protect to let the poison chip away. My Mimikyu is holding the Focus Sash you get from the Pony Wilds, so after that, I use Shadow Claw for a little bit of damage and the Diamond Dragon just goes for another Smart Strike which drops me to my Sash. The poison chips away again and its health is getting really low. I switch into Kai and take a Smart Strike for over half my health, but a final protect on the next turn is enough for the poison to take the dragon out. This fight is always a little anticlimactic because the strategies that take Ultra Necrozma on without losing half of your team normally involve stalling or setting up in one way or another, but it's six levels over our level cap and gets a double omni boost at the start of the battle, so I lose no sleep over cheesing it out. Hope you enjoyed the animation. With Necrozma Mon defeated, we have saved the world and we can now finish the game in peace. Our final island trial is Mina, which requires us to fight a totem or bombi that gets a double omni boost at the start of the battle and is known for setting up quiver dances. I have what I think is my best plan is plan A for this and a really solid plan B, so let's just see which one works. I challenge the totem Robombi and lead off with Silas. On turn one, the B sets up a quiver dance, which is typical, and I go for a hone clause. Robombi calls in Pelipper at the end of the turn, which brings the rain with it. Next turn, the B gets greedy and goes for another quiver dance while I click Shadow Claw. It's a high critical hit chance move, and I'm holding the scope lens to boost my crit rate even higher, so I have a 50% chance to land a crit here, and I do, but it leaves the bee with about a quarter of its health left. The toilet bird just uses stockpile. A dazzling gleam on the next turn breaks my disguise, but on this turn my shadow claw does not crit, and it leaves the pest with just a sliver of health left. The toilet bird once again just goes for stockpile. I look at a calc, and thanks to Mimikyu having an okay special defense stat, it looks like we can actually live a hit, so I stay in and take a dazzling gleam to just 28 health, but a final shadow claw gets a super unnecessary critical hit and KOs. The toilet bird still is just stockpiling. I can't take a single hit from Pelipper and it can't stockpile anymore. So I switch into Liv who snacks on a Scald, but this bird is at stockpile 3. So predicting it to spit up on my mushroom, I double back out into Silas and I got the prediction right. Silas's ghost typing completely negates the attack and the toilet bird loses all of its buffs. So I triple switch back out into Liv and then I click Giga Drain until the bird goes down. 
That's it. Every single island trial done with only shiny fairy types. We've got one grand trial left and it looks incredibly hard. Okay, psych. It's against Hapu and she has only ground types. Liv and Elena make this fight kind of a joke. Here's a quick compilation of all the KOs. And okay, moving on. We've now made it to the end game and the only challenges left for us are in the Pokemon League. Right after I fight the 2008 scene kid one last time. He runs up to me screaming about how Attack Attack was actually an innovative ban for their time or some nonsense and then challenges me. I'm not going to go turn by turn here, but this is the first fight where I really got to use Kai to his full demonic potential. I give it a rest calm mind sleep talk set similar to what Klaus has been rocking for most of the game and priority rest is just so good. It makes your Pokemon so much more bulky than it actually is. Kai solos most of Gladion's team and Liv picks up the scraps. The 2008 scene kid runs off defeated saying something about a new hot topic that opened up on Ula Ula Island and wanting to be the first customer to buy a blood on the dance floor shirt? I don't know. Side note, and very serious at that, blood on the dance floor is utter garbage. Okay, moving on. Now the actual last challenge in front of me is the Elite Four and the Champion Battle. I took some time gathering heart skills to use the move reminder, grabbed the last few TMs I needed, and figured out what sets and what items I wanted to bring in, and this is what I ended up with. Silas, Liv, Elena V, Kai, Stefan, and Caroline. The items and sets might change from battle to battle, but I think this is the only team I stand a chance with in here. Which is kind of sad because I never really got to show off how good Comfey could be, and Klaus has carried us defensively for so long, but I don't think that either one of them offer me enough to justify team slots. With the prep out of the way, I head in. This is one of those newfangled Elite Fours where you can pick the order in which you battle in, so I'm going to go from easiest to hardest. Normally, I would do the opposite, but I think the most difficult Elite Four member here has a very good chance of just ending my run. So I want time to get extra levels, and if I do make it out of that fight after losing a couple of team members, I don't want to have to fight the rest of the Elite Four before battling the champion. So I start off by challenging Acerola. This battle is super trivial with Silas. I lead off with him into Binette, and on turn one, I use Z Splash. Hilariously, the Pokemon Company thought it would be a good idea to make Z Move Boosted Splash raise your attack stat by three stages. So even though Binette breaks my disguise, Silas Okos every single one of Acerola's Pokemon. I do make a mistake against the Frostlass and go for Shadow Claw instead of Shadow Sneak, so I get outsped and confused with a Confuse Ray, but it doesn't end up mattering and I don't get punished. I'd rather be lucky than good. Next up is Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons? Nope, wrong person, Kahili, Keeper of Birds. Deadass, she's the flying type Elite Four member, but she has only birds. There are other flying types, Kahili, you should branch out. I lead with Elena, who is now holding a Choice Specs, and she is able to Oko most of Kahili's team. I one-shot her Braviary with Ice Beam, which brings out her Halucha. The Lucha easily outpaces Elena and can hit for a ton of damage, so I switch into Kai, who is able to paralyze the Halucha. I then bring Elena back out and one-shot it with an Ice Beam. Ice Beam continues to ravage Kahili's team, taking out Mandibuzz and Toucanon until she sends out her Fire Oricorio. A quick switch into Caroline and a single Sparkling Aria clean up the fight, so two down, two to go. The next member I'll fight is Olivia. Before I go in, I realized I haven't had my experience share turned on this entire time, which is not very cash money since I really needed the experience to balance out the levels of the champion fight, but there's nothing I can do about it at this point. I give Primarina the metronome item, which will increase her damage each time she uses the same attack consecutively, and I'm just going to come out and say it, I clicked Sparkling Aria nine times in a row, and that was the battle. Cradilly can always live one, but it just sets up a stealth rock and then died, and Probopass got dropped to its sturdy over and over again until Olivia ran out of full restores. None of her Pokemon outspeed Caroline, and once I hit an attack chain of three, none of them can survive even with sand boosting their special defense, so that's that. The last Elite Four member is Molain, and his entire team is Steel types. I do not have a solid answer to his team, and every strategy I ran a calc for fell short and left me with either most of my team dead or just a wipe. Even with Kai being neutral to steal, he still takes a ton of damage from most attacks and will probably bring out Dugtrio who can one-shot him with Earthquake, which puts me in super awkward positions for switching around. It looks grim, and the only strategy I think I stand a chance with is Stefan. I haven't really used him at all this run, but it's his time to shine. So I lead Stefan into his Klefki, and I've pre-poisoned him on a Grimer from the trainer school, so he can't be paralyzed, and with his Magic Guard ability, he won't actually take any poison damage. I take a pretty hard Flash Cannon on turn one, but then I set up a Calm Mind and get some recovery with leftovers. This 
is my entire strategy. I alternate Calm Minds and Cosmic Powers with Moonlights and Leftovers keeping me healthy until I'm at plus six defense, plus six special defense, and plus four special attack. With these boosts, I will take negligible damage from any attack and be able to one-shot every Pokemon on Molane's team except for the sturdy Magnezone. I start attacking and the keys drop. Metagross comes out next and a Meteor Mash only does 44 HP and damage and it drops to a Flamethrower. Next is Bisharp, whose Iron Hit does about 10%, but I heal back up with a Moonlight and drop it on the next turn with a Flamethrower. Magnezone comes out and miraculously, no critical hits. It goes down after a few full restores. Molane sends out his last Pokemon, Alolan Doug Trio, and goes for his Steel Z move. It does not crit and only does about 20%. Then I burn the trio of Owen Wilsons to the ground with one last Flamethrower. And that is how I beat a team of all Steel types with a single Clefable. One critical hit and I probably lost multiple party members here or potentially wiped, but Stefan held up. One last challenge stands in the way of our victory and that's how. I know a ton of people will probably disagree with this, but Hal's champion team in Ultra Sun and Moon is one of the most balanced champion teams of all time. I move around some items and change some sets and with as much of a plan as I can have, I challenge him. I lead off with Liv into his Raichu and take a pretty hard Psychic, but I spore it so I can get a safe switch into Elena. With her, I use Hail on the first turn while Raichu sleeps, and on the next turn it wakes up and hits me hard with the Psychic, but I am able to set up Aurora Veil, which will stick on the field for 8 turns because I had Elena hold the item Light Clay. Aurora Veil is so clutch because it will half the damage I take from all attacks. I go back out into Liv and start Giga Draining, which causes Hal to switch into Noivern, and I don't have a fantastic way to KO this Pokemon without risking flinches from Air Slashes racking up too much damage, so I switch into Kai. And I won't bore you with the turn by turn here, but just know the set Kai has is Rest, Toxic, Torment, and Protect. I just sit with him on the field being annoying until Noivern goes down. Hal sends in Incineroar, so I make the switch into Silas to negate its incoming Z-move with my Disguise, and then I double switch into Caroline who swallows a follow-up Flare Blitz, and Oko the Cat Daddy with a single Sparkling Aria. Hal sends out his Leafeon next, so in an abundance of caution, I switch into Liv and lower this Sprigatito wannabe's attack to negative 6 with Strength Sap. I bring in Kai to torment it, and then I switch into Elena who can easily take an attack at minus 6 and set up Hail and Aurora Veil once again. Was this necessary? Probably not, but I wanted Aurora Veil up for the incoming Tauros as I think it's easily how scariest Pokemon against my team. I switch back into Liv and drop the Leafeon with a Moonblast, bringing out the Cursed Crab. I bring out Caroline who takes 0 damage from a Power Up Punch? How? Why did you not go for an Ice type attack? Whatever. Caroline cleanly one shots the Crab with a Specs boosted Moonblast, and Raichu comes back out. So it's back out into Liv to finish it off with Giga Drains while staying healthy, and finally Hao sends in his Tauros. Tauros outpaces my entire team, and with Iron Head, it's actually really terrifying if it starts stacking up flinches. But I know Liv Liv can survive one, so I stay in. The bull goes for a double edge, which drops me to just 12 HP, but it also triggers Effect Spore poisoning itself. A Strength Sap drops the Tauros' attack and takes me all the way back up to full after leftovers. I Strength Sap once more to play it safe, and on the next turn, I lock into Moonblast, winning this fairy only run with my favorite fairy type. That feels amazing. This run was so much harder than I thought it was going to be when I started. Between some of my garbage plays an awful RNG in the Togedemaru trial, this was a really demanding run, but it's definitely been one of my most enjoyable. Shinodic is one of my favorite Pokemon, so getting to use it for most of the run was an absolute blast. Let me know who you think the MVP of the run was. I feel like there are three clear options, but I want to hear from you. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing and leaving a like, as those things help me out so much. And also, don't forget to go sign up for a free month of Skillshare using my link and code in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for all the continued support. I'm kind of done here, and I have to leave. Bye.